Have you ever had this kind of experience? There's something that's taken you a very, very long time to work out. Maybe you've made a lot of mistakes and experienced a lot of frustration along the way. And then somebody comes along with the exact same question that you had all those years ago. What do you do? Well, if you're like me, then what you want to do is say, here, take all of my distilled experience and here, have it on the plate. <laughs> and that's really what this video is about. Um, this is about me, my journey, what I feel I've found out about language learning and language acquisition. Obviously, take it all with a big pinch of salt. I am a translator, uh, so I do have a lot of experience with applied linguistics and language learning and so on. Um, I also have the video series Opilina Tokipona and the interviews I've done with people who have been through that video series. So I'm not completely without authority, but you know, I'm, I'm not an academic at all. So these are just my thoughts, take them or leave them, but I hope that ultimately they'll be helpful. Now I'll grant you the title is a little bit clickbaity, but um, I think you'll see that actually it is a fair representation of what I'm about to say. So when I say grammar doesn't exist, what I mean is this. Many people think of language as grammar plus vocabulary, a little bit like leaves on a tree. So you have the tree with the trunk and the branches and so on. And then you have the leaves that are on the tree. And people think that grammar, this system of categories of objects and rules about how these objects interact, exists on the one hand, and that then vocabulary comes along and plugs into it on the other. So you can have the tree, well, the, the trunk and branches without the leaves, and you can have the leaves without the tree, so that language is made of these two things. And what I want to say is that actually the grammar part of it doesn't actually exist. It's a way of thinking about what happens in language, but it doesn't actually exist. And I want to give you uh, what I think is a better way of thinking about language. Uh, so imagine that you look up into the sky and you see a flock of migrating birds. And what do you see? Ah, oh, there's a V. They're flying in a V formation. Now a question, does the V exist? Is there like an invisible V shape in the sky and the birds say, oh, ooh, we must all sit on this V shape as we go. No, that's not what's happening at all. Each bird has its own motivation, which is to fly south using as little energy as possible. And the bird realizes that if it flies just behind and to the side of the bird in front, then it doesn't have to flap its wings so much. And because all the birds are doing this, you end up with a V formation. So the V is an emergent thing. And when you see a V formation, that's you making sense of what you can see. But the V isn't actually there. And the point I want to make is that grammar is the same. The V doesn't exist. Grammar doesn't exist. So what I'm hoping to do in this video is give you an idea of how I came to that conclusion, uh, such that hopefully it will make sense to you as well. And I want to give you an intuitive, you know, real grasp of how language works in the brain if grammar doesn't exist. I want to, secondly, explore some of the things that suddenly start to make sense about language when you adopt this perspective, and especially uh, point out some of the ways that there's a disconnect between second language acquisition research and what many language learners and teachers think about language and how this perspective can actually help with that and of course finally i want to talk about how this realization can be a turning point for you as a language learner or as a language teacher and of course throughout this video whenever i refer to a document or a video I will be leaving a link in the comments, sorry, in the description below. And of course, like I'm saying, this is my journey. This is what I feel I have come to understand. So obviously, if you uh, disagree, 
and I'm sure that many will, then you know, feel free to share your views in the comments. But I am op open to new information and learning as well. And yeah, if, if you feel that there's something that I've really got seriously wrong, or you feel that there's very clearly a hole in my knowledge, there's a video I need to watch, a book I need to read or whatever, then please do fire away. Uh, I'm, I'm really open to that and, and thank you in advance. So what brought me to the idea that grammar doesn't exist? Well, I think for the past year or so, we've all been dealing with ChatGPT entering our lives, or a lot of us have. ChatGPT is frighteningly good at what it does. But you know, as a translator, what particularly interests me is that it's mastered language. It has very good, perfect English, perfect Turkish. And you know, <laughs> just, just I think yesterday or today, I tried interacting with it in Lebanese dialect, you know, Arabic, but with Latin letters such that you've got threes and twos and sevens because you don't have enough letters for all the sounds. And yeah, it, it's okay. It's not great in Lebanese, <laughs> but uh, it can string a sentence together. And that's quite fascinating to me. So it doesn't have an internal grammatical model. That's the interesting thing about uh, GPT-3. Uh, and yet it's very good at language and it's also quite good at translation, which is the thing it was originally designed for. That's quite interesting. And so I decided to just look a little bit closer at how neural networks actually work. And doing a bit of a dive into that just led me around to the idea that, you know what, if these things can master language without an internal grammatical model, then as of 2023, do we really have a good reason to assume that we need such a, an innate grammatical model? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through a, a wonderful video, actually two videos on YouTube that helped me to get an idea of how neural networks work. And I hope that just these few clips will help you to get the essence of it. This is a tweet. It's sloppily written and rendered at an extremely low resolution of 28 by 28 pixels, but your brain has no trouble recognizing it as a tweet. And I want you to take a moment to appreciate how crazy it is that brains can do this so effortlessly. I mean, this, this, and this are also recognizable as threes, even though the specific values of each pixel is very different from one image to the next. The particular light-sensitive cells in your eye that are firing when you see this three are very different from the ones firing when you see this three. But something in that crazy smart visual cortex of yours resolves these as representing the same idea while at the same time recognizing other images as their own distinct ideas. But if I told you, hey, sit down and write for me a program that takes in a grid of 28 by 28 pixels like this and outputs a single number between 0 and 10, telling you what it thinks the digit is, well, the task goes from comically trivial to dauntingly difficult. Unless you've been living under a rock, I think I hardly need to motivate the relevance and importance of machine learning and neural networks to the present and to the future. But what I want to do here is show you what a neural network actually is, assuming no background, and to help visualize what it's doing, not as a buzzword, but as a piece of math. My open. So at this point, what I'd like to just point out is that this problem of recognizing handwritten digits has a similar kind of fuzziness uh, to language. So recognizing a three as a three, even though all threes are slightly different, is a lot like the problem of recognizing that a word is a word. So for example, I'm, I'm English and I pronounce my words differently to the way that you do probably. Um, but still you recognize the words coming out of my mouth as the same as the words that you have in your mind. You see what I mean? And, and the same goes for so many other aspects of language. What a, a phrase or an expression means to me is going to be slightly different to what it means to you. Uh, so I just firstly want to point out that this is a similar kind of problem. Uh, the, the 
the example that he's talking about here and the uh, problem of language itself. If you want to check it out later, this problem that he's talking about is um, related to the MNIST database. Uh, so in the beginning, uh, I think it was in the early 90s, uh, the US census people uh, wanted to come up with a system that could recognize handwritten characters. Um, but this has come to be a pretty um, useful kind of toy demonstration of what neural networks are capable of. So it contains 60,000 training images and 10,000 testing images. And uh, yeah, this is, this is what you've got. You've got all these handwritten numbers and they're the same and recognize them as the same, but uh, you know, at the same time, they're not the same. So how do you recognize that all of these are threes and all of these are fours and no, for the fours aren't threes and, and so on. So now I'm back to the video, skipping forward a bit. And now I want to think about how you might normally go about programming such a system and how our intuitions about how such a system might work can actually wrong foot us. So let's watch. It's meant to be loosely analogous to how in biological networks of neurons, some groups of neurons firing cause certain others to fire. Now the network I'm showing here has already been trained to recognize digits, and let me show you what I mean by that. It means if you eat in an image lighting up all 784 neurons of the input layer according to the brightness of each pixel in the image, that pattern of activations causes some very specific pattern in the next layer, which causes some pattern in the one after it, which finally gives some pattern in the output layer. And the brightest neuron of that output layer is the network's choice, so to speak, for what digit this image represents. And before jumping into the math for how one layer influences the next, or how training works, let's just talk about why it's even reasonable to expect a layered structure like this to behave intelligently. What are we expecting here? What is the best hope for what those middle layers might be doing? Well, when you or I recognize digits, we piece together various components. A 9 has a loop up top and a line on the right. An 8 also has a loop up top, but it's paired with another loop down low. A 4 basically breaks down into three specific lines and things like that. Now, in a perfect world, we might hope that each neuron in the second to last layer corresponds with one of these subcomponents. That any time you feed in an image with, say, a loop up top, like a 9 or an 8, there's some specific neuron whose activation is going to be close to 1. And I don't mean this specific loop of pixels. The hope would be that any generally loopy pattern towards the top sets off this neuron. That way, going from the third layer to the last one just requires learning which combination of subcomponents corresponds to which digits. Of course, that just kicks the problem down the road, because how would you recognize these subcomponents or even learn what the right subcomponents should be? And I still haven't even talked about how one layer influences the next. But run with me on this one for a moment. Recognizing a loop can also break down into subproblems. One reasonable way to do this would be to first recognize the various little edges that make it up. Similarly, a long line, like kind you might see in the digits 1 or 4 or 7, well, that's really just a long edge. Or maybe you think of it as a certain pattern of several smaller edges. So maybe our hope is that each neuron in the second layer of the network corresponds with the various relevant little edges. Maybe when an image like this one comes in, it lights up all of the neurons associated with around 8 to 10 specific little edges, which in turn lights up the neurons associated with the upper loop and a long vertical line, and those light up the neuron associated with the knife. Whether or not this is what our final network actually does is another question, one that I'll come back to when we see how to train the network. But this... So, at this point, what I want to point out is that what... Uh, 3 blue, 1 brown here, is naturally going for, and what I would go for as well, is a symbolic system. So what he's trying to do, or what he thinks is going to happen, is that the network is going to identify uh, ideal forms. And 
will recognize anything that's kind of close enough to these ideal forms. So he starts with this layer, which recognizes the higher level ideal forms of a loop up top and a descender on, on the side. And then you have next level down, you have these uh, smaller components, which are also ideal forms. And when you have you know, the bits of the loop, that bit plus that bit plus that bit, you get the loop. So you have a hierarchical symbolic structure, semantic network, if you will, of what makes a nine a nine. And again, this parallels the way we maybe naturally think about language. You naturally think of language in terms of sentences, words, uh, verbs, nouns, adjectives, phrases, and so on. And we naturally try to break language down into these subcomponents and analyze it that way. So he's going to talk more about how you train the network. And I'm just going to give you a, a, a very oversimplified explanation of, what, of how you train such a network. Basically, what you do is you give it a nine, you look at what lights up on the other end, and let's say the nine is very faint, but the four lights up very brightly. What you do is you go back in the network and you look at which connections supported the nine answer. And what you do is you strengthen those connections. And then you take the connections that supported the wrong answer and you weaken those connections. And the way it's done in a neural network is pure mathematics, pure calculus, and it's called backpropagation. So what you're doing is you're rewarding the connections that give the right answers and you're punishing the connections that give the wrong answers. So you're not directly providing it with a symbolic system, uh, but as he says, uh, you might imagine that to be able to achieve what it achieves, which is identifying numbers, then maybe such a symbolic system is what comes out of this uh, process of feeding it the training set and seeing the answers that come back and adjusting the weights of the connections accordingly. But is that what happens? Let's see. Originally, the way that I motivated this structure was by describing a hope that we might have that the second layer might pick up on little edges, that the third layer would piece together those edges to recognize loops and longer lines, and that those might be pieced together to recognize digits. So is this what our network is actually doing? Well, for this one at least, not at all. Remember how last video we looked at how the weights of the connections from all of the neurons in the first layer to a given neuron in the second layer can be visualized as a given pixel pattern that that second layer neuron is picking up on? Well, when we actually do that, for the weights associated with these transitions from the first layer to the next, instead of picking up on isolated little edges here and there, they look, well, almost random, just with some very loose patterns in the middle there. It would... Isn't that fascinating? So what's going on here is that he, he's looking at each of these neurons in the, in the next layer down, and this is a graphical representation of what it's looking out for. So when this neuron decides if it's going to fire or not, it's, if it's getting a signal from the blue ones, then maybe it will fire. And if it's getting a signal from the red ones, then it's less likely to fire. But look, can you see any kind of symbolic system in this? Look at that, that's quite pretty. That, you are not going to get any kind of symbolic system out of this. In the words of Aristotle, I told you so, Plato, no chips without potato. Well, I mean, obviously I'm paraphrasing because they didn't have potato. Anyway, the point is that this neural network and others like it are proof of concept that patterns don't have to be made of rules. They don't have to reference an ideal form. They just have to be the average of all the examples. Now, of course, he did say, at least for this network, this is what's going on. But this is actually a universal feature of neural networks.
Um, we can look inside a chess computer program or like Shanks restaurant script or any other computer program, any other symbolic computer program, and we can see what it does. We can literally read it out of the code or just see how it works and figure it out that way. We can see what the representations mean. We cannot do this for the neural network. They are not semantically transparent. Indeed, I can take two identical neural networks, uh, but as soon as I start training them, I've initialized them, and they all have different random weighted connections and thresholds. And as I train them, uh, they might achieve the same proficiency in the same task, identifying cats versus dogs, or happy faces versus sad faces, doesn't matter. Whatever I train them to do, they might reach equal proficiency, but those networks, if you were to look inside of them at all of the different weight connections and thresholds and patterns of activation, they would look completely different from one another. So they're not semantically transparent in the way that symbol systems are. So what's the takeaway from this? As I said at the beginning, people think of language as grammar plus vocabulary. And grammar is this idealized system of symbolic objects, verbs, nouns, sentences, verb phrases, noun phrases, predicates, and so on. And there's a set of rules about how those objects interact, and then vocabulary comes along and plugs into it. But what neural networks show is that it is possible to have patterns without rules. Patterns do not need to be made of rules. You don't need a semantic network. You don't need criteria. You don't need ideal forms. You don't need this compositional approach. The patterns of language don't necessarily have to be made of any kind of underlying idealized rules or structures. They could simply be the average of all the forms that you've encountered. And so far, I've talked about these two different positions. In the beginning, I gave you an example of a tree and leaves as kind of the grammar plus vocabulary position. And then the flock of birds that happen to fly in a V formation as the alternative position. And this roughly corresponds to these two positions, generativism and connectionism. Now, generativism, uh, Chomsky, Noam Chomsky is the grandfather of generativism. And he is the one who came up with the idea of universal grammar, a kind of hard-coded a basic structure of language that we're all born with. And he is an intellectual giant. He's on a par with Newton. He revolutionized linguistics before my father was born. So I must admit, I'm very daunted to be taking on his position. And uh, after GPT came out, he gave many interviews, of course, um, but I would like to show you a little clip from uh, his interview with the Machine Learning Street Talk podcast. And let's see what Chomsky has to say about the implications of GPT and other large language models. Assuming that you do believe that large language models are not the solution for natural language understanding, which paradigm do you think is the most promising. Well, first we should ask the question whether large language models have achieved anything, anything in this domain. Answer, no, they've achieved zero. So to talk about the failures, that's beside the point. Do you think there's any, any credibility to what people call hybrid or uh, neurosymbolic and it goes under different labels. Do you, do you, do you think there's anything to that Approach at least okay. Learning everything from data probably is is in, in some people's minds not practical. But is there anything that neurosymbolic approaches or hybrid approaches can can uh, can deliver to uh, the whole debate? Yeah, there's a lot of extremely intelligent, exciting work. It's not it's not trivial work. You know, it was a lot of thought and understanding, mathematical sophistication and so on in this work. It just doesn't happen to be contributing to science. Ouch. <laughs> yeah, Chomsky's not giving an inch. Um, 
Well, I just said Chomsky is the Newton of linguistics. And I think he's reacting the way Newton might have reacted if Newton had had to confront relativity in his own lifetime. Um, you know, Chomsky's been losing ground for quite a while now. Uh, there's a two-part video series by Kay Klein in YouTube. I'm going to show you a clip in a minute. Um, but basically, I mean, a lot of people have heard of universal grammar, uh, but Chomsky had to retreat from that to uh, principles and parameters idea. But the more world languages were uh, studied and there were attempts to fit them into this idea, the more it turned out that actually there's not very many structures that truly are universal. And then ultimately, uh, we came back to recursion. Recursion is the universal property of all languages that is innate, uh, said Chomsky. Now, of course, the recursion debate has no direct bearing on connectionism, but both of them derive from the idea of an innate, symbolic, kind of ideal system. And when that was challenged, what happened? Everett's claims are once again controversial. A 2012 corpus study on this found that they couldn't find any evidence for recursion in Peter Hand, but also that it couldn't be ruled out. Everett maintains that the Peter Hand have recursive thinking and information processing, but that this simply doesn't manifest itself in their language. I want to re-emphasize that the verdict is still out on whether or not Peter Hand has recursion. Chomsky has not waited for those results to come in, and neither will I. He responded to Everett's claims by calling him a charlatan. Apart from personal attacks, he did make a few arguments. Firstly, Chomsky argues that it is impossible for Peter Hahn not to have recursion because recursion is the essential component of the language faculty, a theory Chomsky invented. I think that's enough to give you the general idea. Um, what disturbs me there is really the character assassination. I mean, if your theory really is so strong, then even if you do think that your opponent is a charlatan, you don't need to go down that path. You know, Dan Everett did suffer professional consequences as a result of that accusation. Uh, it just, I don't know, it leaves a bad taste in the mouth. So, you know, again, Chomsky, yeah, I, I, I can't hold a candle to him, but um, I, I'm not about to take his word that large language models don't contribute anything, anything that could possibly undermine his baby. <laughs> And it's not just me who thinks ChatGPT is Chomsky's worst nightmare. Uh, Piantadosi, whose name you might have noticed in that video just a moment ago, uh, released a paper in March 2023, Modern Language Models Refute Chomsky's Approach to Language. And uh, here's a clip of an interview that he gave to the YouTube channel Slater. My own view is, is that it, it really changes pretty much everything in linguistics, right? So. The reason for that is, is that there just haven't been models that work this well in anything, right? So um, if you look at, for example, a uh, generative syntax textbook, you know, it'll have hundreds and hundreds of pages about, um, you know, what the, the likely structures are underlying language and uh, little arguments about why it's this structure and, and not this other structure. Um, but the problem is that um, uh, many of the approaches there start from the same set of basic assumptions, right? So they start by trying to find some small set of discrete rules. Um, they don't start from, um, uh, you know, kind of gradient continuous probabilities and uh, kind of rich ability to, to memorize things. And so um, what that means is that most of those theories, I, I think, are probably not going to last very long, right? Because they're, they're just from the wrong starting points, and they're from starting points that people had uh, decades to work on, um, and that you know didn't that decade those decades of effort didn't produce anything close to the abilities that these models have. Um, so um, I think of them as, as really changing the starting points and the, the core underlying assumptions of, of how we think about uh, you know what it means to represent a grammar or what it means to, to represent linguistic knowledge. Essentially. All models are wrong, but some are useful. How useful has generativism been? How useful has connectionism been? 
you know, neural networks learn languages perfectly without any internal symbolic ideal grammatical model. So why do we need to start with the assumption that we have such a model in our brain? Seeing as we now have a proof of concept in the form of the latest large language models. And of course, some will come at this and say, yeah, but you know, neural networks are theoretical, they're mathematical, they're not biologically plausible. And as I mentioned before, backpropagation, the feedback mechanism used in these uh, neural networks. Um, I mean, you can search for biologically plausible backpropagation. Now, there is literature about that. There are people trying to research that. But even then, I still think that connectionism is in a better place than generativism because, well, let's just think about it this way. Neural networks were inspired by the brain to begin with. And in important respects, they mirror the brain with respect to distributed information and parallel processing. And as for the feedback mechanism, oh, well, backpropagation isn't plausible. There is a feedback mechanism, right? There has to be one, otherwise we'd never learn anything. Okay, so we, well, we just watched in the three blue, one brown videos, the consequences of a distributed information parallel processing system, you know, it's, it's a connectionist approach. You know, the, the V doesn't exist. Grammar doesn't exist. But what have the generativists got? Where is UG in the brain? Where is recursion? Where is the predicate, the past perfect? You know, the generativist side isn't even starting from the point of trying to establish that their model is biologically plausible. So, you know, I'd venture that ChatGPT and similar large language models are enough to shift the burden of proof onto the generativist side to establish that um, universal grammar or you know whatever we call it is biologically plausible. Of course, the other thing that they might say is that, well, there must be something like a universal grammar. There has to be something hard coded because of the poverty of the stimulus. Well, Let's talk about that for a moment. The poverty of the stimulus. Well, what stimulus has GPT been getting? I mean, firstly, GPT-3 is less complex than the human brain, right? So the number of parameters is 175 billion parameters is a big number, but our brains have 80 million neurons times up to 10,000 connections with other with each other neuron. So you're staring down the barrel of a trillion connections. And there are other ways in which our brains are more complex because in neural networks as theoretical objects, basically all neurons fire simultaneously, but our neur neurons don't fire simultaneously. There are delays, there, there are differences in timing in the firing of our uh, neurons, uh, which can make a difference and there are studies uh, into that. So no matter how you slice it, our brains are still more complicated than GPT. So whatever stimulus it's getting, GPT has less resources to work with that stimulus. And as for the stimulus itself, you could say that, oh, well, you know, GPT gets so much more stimulus than, than what we get. It's, well, yes, okay, it is trained on basically the entire internet. <laughs> which is more content than you could consume in lifetimes. But that input is one dimensional. It's just forms. It's, it's one dimensional. We get multi-dimensional input. We don't just get linguistic forms. We don't just get words. We have touch and smell and sight and emotions and theory of mind, you know, trying to work out what other people are thinking and trying to do and trying to say. So I'm not really sure that um, the poverty of the stimulus argument really works anymore. I, it just feels like an Occam's razor situation to me. GPT is less complex than the human brain, gets arguably lower quality input than we get because it's one dimensional, and yet it moves. You know, and yet it masters 
language. So if, if you want, to, this is basically how I came to the idea that connectionism is a better explanation, is a better model, a more useful model for how language actually works in the brain than generativism. If you want to look more into connectionism, there's a very good uh, video by Matt McCormick, which I'm going to link. And there's also um, a book, a, a section of a book uh, by Yasuhiro Shirai uh, called Connectionism and Second Language Acquisition. And he has very kindly uploaded a large part of that to ResearchGate. And you can download that and, and, and read it yourself. It's a really good read. And it just, I don't know, reading that just made everything clearer for me. So, just quickly, how does language work if grammar doesn't exist? Well, I'd just like to quickly walk you through this concept. So first we start with the concept of chunks. So the most familiar chunk to us is probably a word, uh, but uh, chunks don't have to be words in a technical sense. They can be any repeating element in the language. Word all the time. And, and this is my favorite word so far. This is the best word here. I didn't know about this until recently, but I'm, I'm sure you, you know this. Um, uh, the, the meaning of the word, it means that you have now poured enough coffee into my cup. And, and it, goes, it goes like... <laughs> so a chunk is any repeating element. It can be a whole phrase, or it can be a part of a word, or it can be a word. The point is that it repeats. And humans are very, very good at picking up on repeating anything. It's not just humans, animals as well. So uh, Jenny Safran and colleagues in 1996 uh, got eight-month-olds to sit and listen to a recording of artificial words where you couldn't tell where one word ends and the next begins just from pausing or prosody or anything. And after just a couple of minutes of this, they proved that the babies had picked up on the uh, repeating elements. They, they were working out uh, which syllables to group together as words. It's absolutely amazing. But of course, it's not just the chunks. We also need to have uh, word, well, form meaning associations. So how does that happen? Once we've started to perceive these repeating elements, how do we start to um, use those? Well, of course, uh, we pick up on regularities in the meaning. So what is input, essentially? It's, it's forms and meanings together. So we identify a form, and that form is in the presence of a meaning, or I should say an intent. So the person who uses the word is trying to uh, convey a thought or a desire or is trying to achieve something. So on the one hand, as little babies or even adults, we can work out what this person is trying to convey. We comprehend that. And at the same time, we pick up on the forms that they're using at the same time. And that's how we start to connect these chunks with meanings. Okay, but what about grammar? What about these structures? Well, there's a very useful concept called bootstrapping. And I want to uh, show you just a clip from episode 55 of Tea with BVP, uh, which explains what bootstrapping is all about. An example of a chunk would be, do you wanna? A child first and second language acquisition where here's things like, do you want to go? Do you want to eat? Do you want to sleep? Do you want to play? Do you hear, do you want to? Do you want to? And then this other thing afterwards. Notice how that, the prosody will help a child and a second language learner isolate verbs like sleep, want, eat, I mean not want, but eat, sleep, drink, and so on. Do you want to drink something? Do you want to eat something? Blah, blah, blah. Um, but then what happens at the same time is that do you wanna becomes a chunk for that learner. They don't know that it is an auxiliary verb do that carries tense, that you is the subject, wanna is a contracted form of, of another, of a modal want plus a preposition to. They just hear do you wanna. And so do you wanna becomes a chunk. And what's interesting about chunks, 
um, is they never go away. Um, in both first and second language acquisition, we work with chunks all the time. They're stored in our mind just like words. And we rely on those for fluency. So when I say do you wanna in English, I'm not pulling do you wanna as necessarily some do you want to and I'm contracting. I mean, that's possible, but more likely what I'm doing is I'm pulling down do you wanna as a chunk, inserting into this, this sentence I'm making, and then eat. Do you want to eat? So they never go away. But at the same time, over the course of time, I've broken it down. So I have do and you and want and to and all those elements are also in my lexicon with all their functions and so on. So um, who is that that asked that question? Keith. Uh, Keith. So Keith, a chunk, a good example of a chunk is do you want to? Those of you who teach Spanish, another one is como se dice. Students have no idea what como se dice means. They just know it means that's how you ask what a word is. Como se dice apple. Como se dice, right? So, uh, uh, so things like that are, are, are examples of chunks. They have no idea what the el individual elements are, and it's just one big word to them. Yeah, and sometimes they'll actually ask it. <laughs> they'll say, ¿Cómo se dice botella? I'm like, botella? You just said it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but... Uh, oh, significa. ¿Qué significa botella? You know? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, what the, what I've, the reason you know that students don't know or learners don't know what that chunk means is I've had learners in the past say things like, ¿Cómo se dice says? <laughs> well, dice es says. <laughs> That's what dice <laughs> is. If you, <laughs> you have not isolated dice as a verb that means says. And so, ¿Cómo se dice? So, bootstrapping is essentially generalizing over these instances and inducing a pattern from them. But of course, remember, those patterns don't need to be made of ideal forms. They just need to be the average of all the encountered examples. Uh, so all it is is recognizing a pattern between the chunks and then extrapolating on the basis of those chunks, a bit like seeing the birds in a V formation in the sky and saying, aha, where will the next bird come? It will come over here. And, and, and the row of birds will extend out like that. So that's what we're talking about here with, with bootstrapping. We're, we're recognizing a pattern and we're extending uh, the pattern in, um, in, in, in a way that is reliable. Uh, so to give you an example, I just used the word backpropagation a minute ago. Maybe it's the first time you ever heard it. So now if I say, I like sleeping, I like eating, I like backpropagating, you know, when I said the word backpropagating, if you'd never heard of backpropagation before, that would be the first time you've ever heard the word backpropagating. But you wouldn't have flagged it. You wouldn't have said, oh, that sounds wrong. Because, of course, we know, we recognize the pattern that any word that ends in shun can also end in ing. Backpropagation, backpropagating. Uh, so it's pure induction. There's no need for a fixed, idealized, deductive model. Uh, the V doesn't exist. The gram grammar doesn't exist. It's all just collecting these chunks, recognizing the chunks, collecting them, recognizing patterns, and extrapolating the patterns. That's all language needs to be made of. So now I'd like to point out some of the weird things about language that suddenly start to make sense if you accept this connectionist perspective. So firstly, just the general frustrations with grammar and vocabulary that you might have had until now. You can learn grammar, study grammar, plug words into the grammar, generate sentences, but then you go out and use those sentences and every other sentence, you're, somebody's going to tell you, oh no, we don't say it like that. Oh no, 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 we don't, we don't talk like that. We, we use this construction instead of that construction. Oh, nobody talks like that. This is very, very frustrating as a language learner. Uh, but when you have this perspective, then it all makes sense because grammar isn't what the language is made of. The language is made of the instances first. So the native speaker has had exposure to all of these words and chunks and has then extrapolated patterns from those chunks that sometimes hold and sometimes help the native speaker to come up with completely unique utterances. But as Bill Van Patten points out, uh, do you wanna, those, those larger chunks, they never go away. 
And if there is a way that we've always heard it being said, that's how we say it, because that is what comes first. Another thing that you can uh, notice is that the intuition that native speakers have is not easily describable as grammar. If you ask a native speaker to explain something about their own language, very often what they'll do is they'll think for a minute and then they will come up with an explanation and then maybe even you can take that explanation and come up with a counterexample that's obviously wrong. And then you tell the native speaker, the native speaker says, oh, 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 yes, that can't be it. And then they try to come up with another rule for you. And this is the fact, it, it's not just that the rule isn't available to us through introspection, it's that even when we try to, you know, ad hoc come up with a rule, we're really bad at doing it. And that also really should tell us that something else is going on here. The language is not made of grammar. Grammar is a rationalization. It's an explanation we come up with after the fact to try and help us to grapple with this thing we call language. Another thing that makes a lot of sense under a connectionist paradigm is Wittgenstein's family resemblances. So Ludwig Wittgenstein was a very weird kind of philosopher in the sense that in a way we have two philosophers in one lifetime because there was the early Wittgenstein and later Wittgenstein. The early Wittgenstein was one of the pioneers of logical positivism, which tried to establish language as a reliable way of determining truth. So language as a picture of the world, as a representation of the world. But then the later Wittgenstein uh, decided, no, 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 that, that's all wrong. And he came to think of language as more like a game as more of just a tool that we use to interact with each other around the world. And one of the things that he talks about is family resemblances. He called them family likenesses, but uh, we, we talk of them as family resemblances. So uh, there's a, a passage where Wittgenstein invites us to consider, for example, the proceedings that we call games to look and see whether there is anything common to all. The section mentions card games, board games, ball games, Games like Ring a Ring of Roses, you know, the, 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 the games we played as kids, you know, well, before we had phones, <laughs> and concludes, he says, we can go through the many, many other groups of games in the same way. We can see how similarities crop up and disappear. And the result of this examination is, we see a complicated network of similarities overlapping and crisscrossing, sometimes overall similarities. So. What Wittgenstein is pointing out here is that it's very difficult to provide a definition of a game that's reliable. Because what will happen is either you'll make your definition of a game too narrow and it will exclude things that are games. So, for example, if you say that a game must involve interaction between people, then what about solitaire? Is a game with one person? Okay, but it will also, if you leave your uh, definition too broad, then you're going to include things that aren't games. It's very, very difficult to pin down what a game is, but we all know a game when we see one. And so he says, I can think of no better expression to characterize these similarities than family resemblances. Now, Oh, he says, for the various resemblances between members of a family, build, features, colour of eyes, gait, temperament, etc., etc., overlap and crisscross in the same way. So this problem that Wittgenstein talks about, it's a real problem. We, we talk about ideal forms. This is, this is an echo of Aristotle against Plato, like uh, we've kind of joked about before. It's like Plato would go around trying to find the ideal form of things, you know, uh, the, the, the essence of a concept. And what Wittgenstein is pointing out here is that sometimes you just can't find that one essence. But under a connectionist paradigm, it all makes sense. Because a pattern doesn't have to be made of rules, it can just be an average of all the examples. So thinking about language, or oh, just 
turn the light on. Thinking about language in this way uh, also makes sense of how it is that language shifts over time, because everybody has a slightly different perception of the language. Notice, remember that video I showed you by Mind and Metal? You know, you can take the same, you know, architecturally, the exact same um, neural network, start it again with new random parameters, and it can solve the same problem, but you, you know, un open the hood and you have a diff completely different set of weights under, under the hood. It can come up with a, diff a completely unique solution. And this is what happens with us with language, and this is why language shifts over time. I think a really good example of this is linking and intrusive R. So in my accent, as you'll have noticed, I'm from the southeast of England, and we have what's called intrusive R. So there are some really good examples of this. So for example, in, in English, English, you know, uh, the Beatles. I saw a film today. Oh, I saw a film. I saw a film. Um, and then you've got uh, Oasis, Champagne Supernova. Champagne Supernova in the sky. Yeah. And what's funny about this is that English people uh, won't realize they're doing this until you tell them. You know, we're not aware of this. It just, it just happens. And, and you can see how, because um, it means that over time, we've reinterpreted that sound. So uh, in the beginning, of course, you know, in the past, both sides of the Atlantic, we were pronouncing all our R's. So, uh, for example, go back 400 years, laser was laser, would have been laser. <laughs> Not now, of course. Well, it's, it's a new word, but anyway. So I have an example. I want to use my example anyway. So somebody from 400 years ago, either side of the pond, would have said laser as laser and would have said NASA as just NASA. Now, of course, in America, it's still laser and NASA. But in England, NASA, laser, the same sound at the end, NASA, laser. And of course, for me, in, in my brain, I have solved the problem of English. Um, and identified the ends of those two words as the same. But then I also noticed that, for example, um, is that laser on? What's happening? I'm not interpreting that as is, is that laser on? I'm interpreting that sentence, is that laser on, as is that laser -er on? So what must be happening is that my brain is analyzing the er as something that's added in between words. So I'm not perceiving the er as part of the word laser, which means that, you know, um, an article by NASA Ron is the most natural thing in the world for me to say. Oh, did you see that article by NASA on the next space telescope? Yeah, by, by NASA Ron, right? So the, the way my head is perceiving the language is different to the way an American perceives the language in the big ways, but even within the same population, you know, these differences in, in how we've identified these patterns uh, can sometimes take a while to come out in the wash. What I also want to point out is that when you have this connectionist way of thinking about how language actually works, it can help to bridge the gap, at least in your mind, between what's actually going on in second language acquisition research and the perceptions and ideas of language learners and teachers. Because what you will find some people say is that, well, okay, Krashen came up with the input hypothesis. Yes, but there's also the output hypothesis. And there's the noticing hypothesis. You know, there's all these different hypotheses. And so you just have to go with, with whatever uh, works for you, um, which, you know, is okay to begin with, but it gives you the impression that there are these totally opposite ideas about language acquisition, and they're all in the same footing, almost as if there's um, input, yes, or input, no, theories about language acquisition. But 
uh, there was um, an, uh, an essay just a couple of years ago, um, Crashen, was he right, 40 years later, by Van Patten and Lichtman. And what they established quite convincingly is that even though not everybody talks about comprehensible input, basically it is a consensus position in second language acquisition that whether you call it comprehensible input or communicative input or uh, meaning-based input, no matter what you call it, input, actual experiences of the language in use to convey thoughts is essential. You are not getting anywhere without input. Nobody contests this. What people do contest is the idea that it's only input, that only input is necessary, or that even only input is what helps acquisition, because that's Krashen's position. But the debate is not input, yes, input, no. The input, the, the debate is between input only against input plus. Let's put it that way. Everybody agrees that input is absolutely fundamental. But why do we have this disconnect then? Well, of course, Krashen will talk about how, you know, uh, <laughs> some people need to sell textbooks and sell courses based on textbooks. And, and there is a lot to be said about that. But there is also a kind of dissonance in this connection of the input hypothesis with generativism. And of course, I can't fault Krashen for hitching his wagon to Chomsky, because back when uh, Krashen got into this game, you know, Chomsky was the only game in town. Uh, but when you think about it, what does generativism say? It says that language is a symbolic system that, at least in principle, is explicitly describable. And yet, what does you know, the input-based thing tell us? What is the input-based position? Well, it's that, well, no, you can't learn language through explicit instruction. You have to have exposure to the language in a meaningful way, such that your your brain can pick up the language through induction. So that's implicit learning. So it's something explicitly describable, but that you have to learn implicitly. There's a disconnect here. It's like, well, seeing as how what we're trying to acquire is an explicit system, well, why don't we get a head start by explicitly learning about grammar? seeing as that's what we're trying to get into our heads okay and then you end up with things like tprs and so on um you know I, i'm not saying that it necessarily doesn't help i'm not saying go, don't go study grammar but what i am saying is that if you recognize that the brain is a pattern recognition system that does not rely on ideal forms and grammar doesn't actually exist in the brain. It's just a map to what we see going on with language that maybe helps us to make sense of it and helps us to deal with it. But what we're trying to get into our heads is not actually grammar. Uh, then it inoculates you against, um, you know, people who are trying to put a spin on it for their own, for their own purposes. Or, you know, just maybe honest misunderstandings, let's say. Because, like I said, there's an inherent dissonance there. So, yeah, you just need a massive training set. You need lots of experience, lots of experiences of forms accompanied by meanings. And under the connectionist uh, idea, that would mean that every single experience you have of forms accompanied by meanings, you know, when you can work out the meaning, when you can work out what the person is actually trying to express, and you experience them expressing that through forms, every single experience of that kind leaves its mark. And it's not that you carry around with you in your head the memories of all the times that you heard a specific word. It's not like that, but it's like with the training set with the numbers. You show it a three, it gets it wrong. What do you do? Adjust the connections. Adjust the, um, adjust the weights of the connections and move on. It's not that you can remember that three that you saw, 
in the case of the neural network, but every single test, every single attempt to predict what it is, leaves its mark because there's something going on which is providing feedback to the system. And so again, the noticing hypothesis, you know, this kind of, this inoculates you against the hot mess that is the noticing hypothesis. So in, in 91, Schmidt came along and said, oh yeah, you need to notice things in the input to be able to acquire them. And then Truscott comes along and says, what do you even mean by noticing? You know, attention and awareness, are they really the same thing? And then Greg says, well, how can you notice grammar when grammar is an abstraction that isn't actually there in the input? Right? And so much so that Schmidt ended up revising his uh, hypothesis twice, once in 2001, again in 2010. And he ended up coming to a position that, well, noticing isn't necessary, but it helps. He came to that position. And also that what we notice is surface features of the language, just, just words. We, we, we're, not, we're not actually, we don't actually need to notice grammatical features consciously. There's none of this, oh, look, the third person uh, singular verb in English always has an, as it has an S sound on it. I must pay attention, I must uh, acquire, there's not, that's not part of the noticing hypothesis as revised by Schmidt. But in, when people still talk about the noticing hypothesis as if it's on the same footing as the input hypothesis, uh, but when you, again, come at this from a connectionist perspective, then, well, what, what, what are we talking about here? You have a pattern recognition system that is continually trying to identify things and identify chunks. Um, and when its predictions are consistently correct, that means you've recognized a pattern and that means you've noticed the pattern. So noticing is a consequence of the pattern recognition system doing its work and and again on a similar vein the output hypothesis people say oh yes there's the input hypothesis input hypothesis but there's also the output hypothesis so you know there's no 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 output hypothesis is not the opposite of the input hypothesis it's an add-on to the input hypothesis it's saying yes but sometimes output is also necessary for acquisition. That's the output hypothesis. So again, input is king. This is a consensus position. But I'm seeing a lot of confusion because of this dissonance that comes from the generativist idea that grammar is real and innate in the brain. So that means that language is an explicitly describable structure that nevertheless must be acquired implicitly. Huh? But under a connectionist paradigm, it just all makes sense. So where am I going with this? Well, last point. <laughs> what difference can this make to you as a language learner? Well, if you believe that grammar exists, you're going to try and get it into your head. And as I've said, down that road lies a lot of frustration and confusion. So you're going to keep grammar in its place. Grammar is not is a map, not the territory. You know, it might help you. Strictly speaking, you don't need it because it's not the stuff that language is made of. But you know, maybe it could prime your pattern recognition system. Maybe. Or maybe your time is better spent just trying to experience the language meaningfully as much as you can. Comprehensible input, in other words. And also, having this perspective can keep you aware of the fact that input really is essential, but it means that you always keep that basis while you're exploring other ideas about language acquisition, like, well, can grammar help? Can explicit learning help? And also ideas such as auto-input. So 
prescient in his book, Principles and Practice, he actually does say on page 21, in a footnote, that it is possible for you to give yourself comprehensible input, but he says that this is a very uh, negligible thing, because to be able to give yourself comprehensible input, you have to somehow have it such that your monitor, your conscious knowledge of the language, is just above your competence in the language that you've acquired, such that you're giving yourself the next form that you're ready to acquire through your output while you're communicating. Because, of course, that plugs into the I plus one idea. Well, if you, if you accept connectionism, then you can take most of Krashen's ideas, but the I plus one bit you don't actually need because instead of saying that, again, language is uh, like, like a tree where each branch has to come in its turn, you're saying that, no, it's a pattern recognition system that is, tra that is making progress on recognizing all patterns simultaneously. So although, of course, you know, some patterns depend on other patterns, and there is going to be a natural order in general of which kinds of patterns are going to be recognized first. There's not a step by step process where it's like building a wall and, you know, you can't have this brick until you have all the previous bricks. No, it's all the patterns are being gradually pulled into focus simultaneously. But of course, the consequence of that is that when you are using conscious knowledge of a language, to produce output at above your competence, that's all going in as data. And that is the big um, observation of ALG, automatic language growth, um, which is that if you output, if you force output too early, you can mess yourself up, especially for a language like Thai with tonal systems. Um, so how does this affect you as a language learner? Well, if you have this connectionist standpoint, then you're going to recognize input as absolutely essential because that is your training set. You can't train and your, your neural network. You can't train your brain without a training set of actual experiences of the language in use. But conscious knowledge might help. And you also want to be careful uh, of how your training set might be influenced by your own output if you're outputting uh, based on explicit knowledge rather than the patterns that you've naturally recognized. So, yeah, I know I've, I've talked about a lot of different things in this video, but um, yeah, my purpose is just to take all of this experience and and whatever you want to call it and just put it on a plate and give it to you so take it do what you want with it uh, but i hope that maybe this perspective will be helpful to you as you grapple with with this amazing thing we call language thanks for watching